Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to talk about tamper protection in Defender for Endpoints specifically, but this concept of tamper protection does apply to other endpoint protection solutions that are out there. Other vendors have some sort of flavor of this that can be turned on or off. And so the reason why I wanted to talk about this was we at Microsoft came out with a blog recently announcing that Tamper protection for Defender for Endpoint will be turned on for all existing customers unless you already have it explicitly turned off. And that's starting to roll out on October 24th of this year. So a little less than a month. Tamper protection actually has already been turned on by default for home users since it came out in March of 2019. And then last year, it was turned on by default for new customers of Defender for Endpoint P2 or M365 E5. I definitely recommend this. Adam, I know you recommend this, and this is Microsoft's stance, is that you should turn this on unless there's specific instances or for whatever reason testing that you want to have it off. And after October 24th of this year, you're going to actually explicitly have to define that in policy to turn it off. You have to opt out. It's going to be turned on by default. So what is tamper protection exactly? Really what it is, it's a, it's a feature. It's a specific feature within Defender for Endpoint, and it's available on Windows 10 and 11 Server 2012 R2, 2016, 2019, and 2022, as well as Mac OS. It is currently not available for Linux. We'll talk about that a little bit later on why that is. But for the majority of Windows modern operating systems, as well as server that are supported, it is available. It's not available for Windows 8.1 or Windows 7. One of the reasons why this feature was implemented is actually because we saw several attack vectors where the attackers were turning off the endpoint protection. So they would compromise the device through a vulnerability or the network or whatever. And then once they got access to the device, you can use PowerShell or registry modification to turn off endpoint protection, whether it's Defender for Endpoint or something else, really. Any endpoint protection usually can be just turned off. And then, of course, like once it's turned off, you can deploy anything you want. Malware, <laughs> ransomware, it's a free game at that point. And so Microsoft, at the beginning of 2019, or you know even further back, started developing this and then rolled it out in 2019. And it's really been a huge way to protect against this specific attack vector. So what sort of things, Adam, can uh, like customers expect this to protect against once they turn it on? Well, if you think to reports of, of several recent security incidents at major organizations, oftentimes part of the narrative has been exactly what you just described, that attackers got in, and one of the first things they did was disable the endpoint protection before proceeding with their attack. So this is a very well-known real world thing that attackers do. And of course they do. I mean, it's makes a ton of sense, right? And so when tamper protection is enabled, even if you are the admin on the machine, there are things you can't do like disable virus and threat protection, disable real-time protection, turn off behavior monitoring, disable the antivirus protection, like the, the um, office antivirus disable cloud delivered protection, remove security intelligence updates, like, you know, all the things that normally your endpoint protection platform is doing, you know, turn all that off. 
uh, suppress notifications so the users don't get notified that something's funny going on, disable scanning of archives and network files, disable automatic actions on detected threats, like automatically quarantining or deleting them. So when, and when tamper protection is enabled, all that stays on and attackers can't disable it just because they have admin on a machine, which is incredibly advantageous to stopping an attack in its first steps. Absolutely. And how it does this is it essentially locks these values, right? So cloud deliver protection is turned on once you have tamper protection turned on. AV obviously is turned on. Real-time protection is turned on. And once that is turned on, it's locked in place. And you cannot change it through registry editor. You can't change it through PowerShell. You can't change it through group policy. It has to be done through some sort of device management. So SCCM um, or uh, Intune are pretty much uh, the only ways that you can turn it on or off. So so let's just talk about that real quick because obviously Configuration Manager, if you're using Configuration Manager, you can, as uh, admin of SCCM, can turn this feature on or off for specific device groups within there as well as Intune. So those are those are pretty obvious. If you have a device that's not in management, you can turn it on and off locally on the device. So if it's just standalone and not managed through SCCM or Intune, then you can go in. So you can look at your home computer. If you have a, a home machine on Windows, you can go in and take a look at it. And you'll be able to turn on and off tamper protection. If it's on, you can't turn off those things that we were talking about, but you can turn off tamper protection if that makes sense. So it's like a one switch. And if you're an admin, you can turn it on or off um, if it's outside of management. Obviously, if it's within management, that option is going to be grayed out. You could also manage this setting through the Defender portal. If you do that, like have it, uh, what we call a Defender for Endpoint Security Settings Managed Device, which doesn't require enrollment into a device management solution. It's just being managed through Defender for Endpoint, and it has certain ways that it can just manage the security settings, this being one of the security settings. If you're doing it that way, that's okay. It does require dependency on the cloud deliver protection, which does require connection to the internet to turn that um, that setting on or off. So you got to have cloud deliver protection turned on or Microsoft's advanced protection service. To check if it's turned on, you can just go to the security app within Microsoft and see if it's turned on, or you can do a PowerShell commandlet called get MP computer status and look to see is tamper protect is tamper protected or real time protection enabled equal true and if it does then you're good to go. You can also view any type of tamper attempts to disable or or do anything with it. Um, those alerts will show up within the Defender portal. For macOS, I wasn't able to verify this, but I believe this is also going to apply to Mac OS MDE. If it's not, we'll make a correction at a later show, um, but I wasn't able to, to look that up. Right now, there are three modes when you deliver Defender for Endpoint to a Mac. There's Disable, Audit, and Block. And right now... Before it becomes default, disable is still the default option. And like I said, I, I believe it's it's going to be turned to block when the Windows side is going to be turned on. You can set it to disable and that just changes, you know, it doesn't have anything turned on. If you have it on audit, it will show any type of tamper operations that are in the logs, but it won't specifically block anything. And then if you set it to block, it will fully turn on tamper protection and all tampering operations are blocked. And so like tampering operations are 
actions to uninstall Defender for Endpoint, trying to edit any of the config files, creation of new files under a location that is um, uh, under a Defender for Endpoint location, um, trying to delete any of the Defender Endpoint files, renaming of the files, or any commands to stop the agent. All that will be blocked um, when it is turned on. And you can manage those settings through either a manual configuration where you literally are just entering in a command locally in the bash um, uh, window or through Jamf or Intune via a configuration XML file. And I mentioned Linux in the beginning. Tamper protection is on the roadmap. I was sitting in one of our product calls and some folks were talking about it and when is it coming out and it's been on the roadmap for a long time. And it, it is something that they're aware of and that they're working on, but because of the way Linux works, if you have root, you pretty much have free reign over the operating system. So it's a little bit more difficult to implement for Linux. Um, there are some tamper resistance features built in and certainly any type of actions to disable or uninstall the agent uh, are logged, but it's not protection parity with the other operating systems quite yet. Just a note on the, the Mac OS piece, just to clarify what Andy was saying when he was talking about whether or not this applies to Mac OS, Mac OS does have tamper protection with defender for endpoint. That was not what Andy was questioning because he obviously went through the detail on how you enable it. What he was saying, we just need to confirm is whether or not it's having it enabled by default, October 24th, along with its windows brethren. And again, we'll follow up on a future show, but assume that's going to happen until said otherwise. I, the, the only um, data point I would add to Andy to that conversation is it looks like tamper protection on Mac OS is still in preview. So more likely than not, maybe not being rolled out automatically, but you know, we'll, we'll follow up on a future show with the deets, but either way, a good thing to get familiar with and be prepared for. I forgot that it was in preview. Thanks. It's, we sent on so many internal calls and features that are in preview and roadmap. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to, to note that it is in preview. So with that in mind, it probably is not going to be enabled by default is right. my, is my guess. That would yeah, be my guess too. Yep. Yep. And preview features, just for people's, I mean, situational awareness, sometimes preview features get rolled back. They're not always things that will get rolled out into production. A lot of common features that are, have been asked for, like this one here, tamper protection for macOS, 99.9%, .9 pretty sure that it will not get rolled back. But there are many features that go into preview that are rolled back. So, um, yeah, for them to turn it on by default for a preview feature, probably not going to happen. Agreed. So, mm -hmm. good call out there, and thanks for the update on that, Adam. Yep, that was like a real-time follow-up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about in the industry tamper-proof, and that's a whole nother conversation because in order to make something tamper-proof, in my opinion – it would mean that you cannot turn it off or modify it, right? And so in this case, like if you're compromising your admins who still have access to the configuration, then you technically can still disable the protection, right? Attackers could get those credentials, access the security portal, just like they did, you know, we talked about the Uber um, security incident where they compromised the vault, compromised the admin credentials, and then were able to get access to the security portal. You can pretty much do whatever you want. So this is protection from the device level. If that device gets compromised, you're not able to manipulate the settings outside of the management. So still a very good thing. And again, like I mentioned this at the beginning of the show. If you're not on Defender for Endpoint, just talk to your solution vendor that is your endpoint protection and ask about this type of feature. Maybe you already know about it. Maybe you have it enabled. Maybe you don't. And if you don't, I would definitely look at getting this type of feature enabled because not being able to modify the settings locally is key. You know, like even to be able to add in an exception, right? If I was an attacker, 
maybe I can't turn it off, but I can access the exceptions list. Well, I'm just going to make a folder an exception and then drop my malware in there and execute it from there, right? So there's a lot of different ways you want to make sure that these settings are just configured through your and your uh, device management solution. Speaking of exceptions, I know we all have short-term memory sometimes, but exceptions was one of the reasons the SolarWinds exploits were able to propagate so prolifically is because SolarWinds by default recommended you exclude it from all your antivirus monitoring. So um, that's a good call out there. Just on a total random side note that you should be very, very, very conservative with exclusions you do put into place. Uh, for that exact reason. And that, that applies not just to antivirus, it applies to email as well, which is another conversation for another time. But um, yeah, don't expect, don't accept stuff unless you really, really have to. Yeah. It's, it, that's a great call out, Adam, because I actually had a conversation with a customer this week about them migrating from one EDR solution or antivirus solution to another, they happen to be wanting to move off of one competitive vendor onto Microsoft's and they wanted to know how to migrate their exceptions policies over. And I said, well, you pretty much have to do it manually because there's just no way to like export it via like a CSV or XML or whatever. You have to look at it and then add it in. However, I said, this is a good time to review that list because I bet there's things on there that you don't need to accept anymore. So look at each exception, whether it be a file path or a file type even, and ask yourself if that should be on the exceptions list because every single exception is a hole in your security, right? So um, yeah, maybe do an audit of your exceptions list at some point, which might be very long if you've had your solution for a long time. So, you know, mm -hmm. take a look and, and be very cautious of what you're adding, just like what Adam said. Mm -hmm. And that's our show for this week. Hopefully you learned something about tamper protection. And if you don't have it on, it's going to be turned on for you. Otherwise, make sure that you have a policy um, there to disable it if that's what you want to do. However, we recommend that you leave it on. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions, comments, topics that you want us to talk about on future shows. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.